Welcome to part one of Introduction to Internal Audit. Part one will be unpacking the standards in the IPPF. The Institute of Internal Auditors have provided the definition of internal audit. Internal auditing is an independent, objective, assurance and consulting activity designed to add value and improve an organization's operations. It helps an organization accomplish its objectives by bringing a systematic, disciplined approach to evaluate and improve the effectiveness of risk management, controls and governance processes. The key words in the definition are the provision of assurance and consulting activities. And no, the definition says nothing about the profession being fault finders. The internal audit function will and should work hand in hand with the organization to achieve an effective governance and controls framework. What are the fundamental components of any profession? Just like doctors, lawyers, and accountants, a profession needs a body to govern the profession. And that is exactly what the IIA has set out to achieve. Today, being an internal auditor is a professional activity, with almost all major organizations in the world either having an in-house practice or outsourced arrangements in place. As a member of a profession, all members will have to adhere to the standards and code of conduct. So what are the criteria of an internal audit function? As mentioned earlier, internal auditors provide assurance and consulting services to the organization. And importantly, it confirms to the attribute and performance standards of the IPPF. So before diving into what the important components of the IPPF is, let's look at what it means to provide an assurance and consulting services. Providing assurance services is essentially providing an independent assessment on the organization's governance, risk management activities, and the internal controls framework. On the other hand, consulting services is when internal auditors provide advisory to the management or clients, which is intended to add value to the organization. Let's now take a deep dive into the IPPF framework, more specifically, the standards. It is mandatory for all practicing internal auditors to adhere to the standards. And over the years, the standards has become the benchmark of measuring the methods and performance of internal auditors worldwide. The IPPF was designed with 10 core principles at the heart of the framework which basically strives to promote integrity in the framework while also emphasizing on the importance of communication. The standards provide internal auditors with the essential and mandatory guidance for meeting their responsibilities as internal auditors and also acts as a blueprint for professional internal auditing worldwide. As the standards work as the benchmark for internal audit, it has also become the criteria used to evaluate and measure the operations of an internal audit activity. As a result, internal audit functions all over the world are evaluated on the same criteria and standards, which has also enabled internal auditors to work anywhere in the world, with language being the only barrier. It is therefore very important to thoroughly understand and practice in accordance to the standards. Among many other things, the, standards, the standard also provides tools such as the components and as well as the necessity to develop an internal audit charter. Let's look at the attribute standards. They are basically four main categories in this standard. The 1000 series talk about the purpose, authority and responsibility of internal auditors. 
the 1100 series speak about the independence and objectivity. 1200 series touch on proficiency and due professional care for internal auditors. And the 1300 series covers the quality assurance and improvement programs all internal audit activities should have in place. Now, once you've covered all the attribute standards, you'll have a very good knowledge on what the internal audit charter and the internal audit manual should look like. We'll also be introducing several templates that you can use uh, in the internal audit activity uh, to carry out internal audits. We'll also be touching on the important components that an internal audit report should have. And we'll also be discussing how an internal audit organizational structure should look like. Let's dive in. The 1000 series speaks about the purpose, authority and responsibility of an internal audit. The nature of the assurance services and consulting services provided to the organization must be defined in the internal audit charter. As part of purchasing this webinar, you would be entitled to obtaining from us our industry best practice template of an internal audit charter, which you can use as a starting point in developing your internal audit activities charter. The 1100 series speaks about the independence and objectivity. Independence is, a freed, is the freedom from conditions that threaten the ability of the internal audit activity to carry out internal audit responsibilities in an unbiased manner. The chief audit executive must report to a level within the organization that allows the internal audit activity to fulfill its responsibilities. In fact, the CAE must confirm to the board at least annually that the organizational independence of the internal audit activity is still sound. The CAE must at all times be able to communicate and interact directly with the board. Where the CAE has or is expected to have roles or responsibilities that fall outside of internal auditing, safeguards must be in place to limit impairments to independence or objectivity. Internal auditors must have an impartial, unbiased attitude and avoid conflict of interest. Should there be a conflict of interest, the conflict of interest should be disclosed before any audit activity begins. Series 1200. The internal audit activity must collectively possess or obtain the knowledge, skills and other competencies needed to perform its responsibility. It is often the case that internal audit activities would not be able to accumulate all the required skill sets in its in-house team, which is when the CAE must use external subject matter experts to carry out internal audits in this situation. Internal auditors must apply the care and skills expected of a reasonable, prudent and competent internal auditor. Due professional care does not imply infallibility. Internal auditors must continue to enhance their knowledge, skills and other competencies through professional development. One way of staying above this is by joining the IIA and taking part in all its training and development programs and accumulating those CPE points. The CAE must develop and maintain a quality assurance and improvement program that covers all aspects of the internal audit activity. These programs must be carried out by both internal and external assessments. Ongoing monitoring of the performance and periodic assessment of the internal audit activity should be done by people within the organization with sufficient knowledge of internal audit practices. At the same time, external assessments must be conducted at least once every five years by a qualified independent assessor. 
The CAE must communicate the results of these quality assurance and improvement programs to senior management and the board. They should also disclose the qualification and independence of the assessors, including any conflict of interest if there were. Now, we will be looking more in detail into the performance standards of the IPPF. Now, the performance standards basically is how you're going to carry out the internal audit activity. There are seven series in this standard. Uh, they range from managing internal audit activity, the nature of the work, engagement planning, how to carry it out, how to communicate the results, and how to perform uh, ongoing monitoring of the audit recommendations. Series 2000, managing the internal audit activity. Now the CAE must effectively manage the internal audit activity to ensure it adds value to the organization. The CAE must ensure that the internal audit activity confirms with the code of ethics and the standards of the IIA. The CAE must effectively establish a risk-based plan to determine the priorities of the internal audit activity. At the same time, the CAE should consider accepting proposed consulting activities based on the engagement potential to improve the management of risk and add value to the organization. The CAE must develop an internal audit plan which will then be approved by the board. This plan must be properly communicated to the senior management of the organization. The CAE must also ensure that the internal audit activity has the appropriate resources to sufficiently and effectively deploy the approved internal audit plan. Apart from that, the CAE must also establish policies and procedures to guide the IA activity. These policies and procedures must confirm with the IPPF. The CAE should also share information, coordinate activities, and consider relying on work of other internal and external assurances and consulting service providers to ensure a proper coverage and minimize duplication of effort and audit fatigue. The CAE must report to the senior management and board regarding its performance of the audit plan, its conformance to the Code of Ethics, and any significant or control issues or of fraud and risk governance issues it has uncovered during the course of its activities. When an external service provider serves as the internal audit activity, that provider must make the organization aware that the organization has the responsibility for maintaining an effective internal audit activity. The internal audit activity must evaluate and contribute to the improvement of the organization's governance, risk management, and control processes using a systematic, discipline, and risk-based risk approach. Internal audit must assess and make appropriate recommendations to improve the organization's governance processes. The internal audit activity must also evaluate the effectiveness and contribute to the improvement of the risk management processes. The internal audit activity must evaluate risk exposures relating to the organization's governance, operations, and information systems. Series 2200, Engagement Planning, a very critical step in carrying on an internal audit. Traditionally, or basically most internal audit activities, we use a document that's called Terms of Reference, Scope of Work, um, Statement of Work. They all refer to the same document. This document would have 
the engagement's objective, scope, timing, and resources allocated. Um, these will also normally be tied in to the organization's strategy, objective, and risk relevant to the engagement. This document is important because it not only outlines the scope for the internal auditor to follow, it also outlines the scope for the management or the audit being audited for them to have that expectation of what's being covered. There are several ways we can go about carrying out the engagement, but basically this involves testing. Um, the most common method or the most best practice to put in perspective uh, would be the risk and control matrix or better known as the recommend industry. Now the risk and control matrix is the most effective way because what it does is it outlines all the risk involved in that engagement based on the scope identified in the terms of reference. We have a whole chapter on how to um, basically perform an audit based on the, on the, on the risk and control matrix. Um, you would also find templates of uh, risk and control matrix that you can use for your organization on our website. So basically, once you've outlined all the risk associated with the scope, we would then try or rather through audit walkthroughs, map out existing controls in place to address this risk. That process would involve, well, if the auditor has noted gaps, then those gaps would be uh, put into recommendations in the audit report. However, if there was no gaps or if there are controls that have been outlined, the auditor would then proceed to test those controls. Now, once we have completed the testing phase, we would then have to communicate our results. The results are usually communicated in the form of a report. It is important to note that when we are communicating uh, our results, it's easy to only focus on the breakdowns in internal controls. While that is really important, internal auditors should also focus or should also give some sort of importance to reporting where there were good practices or best practices in terms of controls that were noted during the audit. Now, the audit reporting phase usually would have all the recommendations outlined by the internal auditors and also management response to those recommendations. So management would undertake to carry out those recommendations and provide due dates as to when those recommendations can be carried out. Once internal auditor has obtained this uh, management acceptance and the due dates, there needs to be a place where the progress of carrying out these recommendations is actually monitored and the CAE should be reporting on the progress to the board and audit committee. When the CAE concludes that management has accepted a level of risk that may be unacceptable to the organization, the CAE must discuss the matter with senior management. If the CAE determines that the matter has not been resolved, then the CAE must communicate the matter to the board. The Code of Ethics The IIA has defined as part of the framework the Code of Ethics for all internal auditors. The Code of Ethics apply to entities that provide internal audit services. Now the purpose of the Code of Ethics is to promote an ethical culture in the global profession of internal auditing. Thank you for joining us on our webinar where we unpacked the IPPF standards. Uh, if you found this beneficial to you, please feel free to share or even uh, recommend this to uh, other people. And uh, please feel free to reach out to our firm. We've got heaps of resources within our firm to help you uh, and your organization's journey in developing your internal audit and risk management processes. Thank you.